The do-it-yourself idea has a long history. In the case where something goes wrong and a repair service isn't nearby, well, you have to improvise. And there goes the mizzen mast, blimey. If she's not repaired, we're sunk. Arr! We sail upon a three-masted schooner, and yet there are only two mates aboard. Well, with labor costs so high, management thought economizing... Piracy ain't what it was. Arr! Tie this rope to me waist and hold tight. I'll glue the mast myself. Even emergency medical situations can require a solo performance. Dang, that mishap with the thresher nearly severed my arm clean off. But if I just take a swig of moonshine and grab a hold of this tourniquet with my teeth, I can stitch it up like new. Now, self-repair gets a modern makeover with high-tech tools that allow for recovery from the inside out, permitting highways to fix themselves and your body cells to get a boost in fighting off disease. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, we examine the idea of self-repair. Why bring in teams of fix-it experts if we can design machines and materials that self-heal and coax our immune system to more efficiently and effectively do the same? And by the way, that last idea could require billions of nanobots that you swallow. But can all that is broken be repaired? A story from the seas says it may take a thousand years to undo the effects of climate change. It's The Fix Is In. In the film, Terminator 2, the cyborg motorcycle cop is made of some strange state of metal. When fire melts his body, it reforms itself back into impressive buffness, and he's soon on his menacing way. Non-cyborg humans don't have this type of regenerative ability, but some other animals do. Michael and I have been working on the, this species of jellyfish called the moon jellyfish, Aurelia, and we discovered that it has an uncommon way of repairing itself. If it's injured, instead of regenerating the missing parts, it just recycles what's left and rearrange itself and regain radial symmetry. As a biologist in her lab at the California Institute of Technology, Leah Guntara and her team study how living things work and function. And as the discovery of the moon jellyfish's talent has demonstrated, nature's adaptive abilities continue to astound. You may have heard of jellyfish that regrow a limb after one's been lost. This kind of regeneration is rare, but it's not unheard of. Certain salamanders might surrender their tail in a fight and grow a new one in a few weeks. However, the ability of the moon jellyfish to rearrange its remaining limbs after injury may be unique in the animal kingdom. Graduate student Michael Abrams was surprised to witness it one day when he was working with these soft marine animals. Michael, is this analogous to, for example, if I lost an arm somehow, that I would move the other arm around to the, I don't know, the middle of my chest or something? You know, to make myself symmetric, is that the equivalence? Yeah, that's a pretty good way of thinking about it, keeping in mind that you'd have to be made out of jelly. <laughs> well, I I'm not. <laughs> so this species of jellyfish, uh, Aurelia, <laughs> now if I saw one of these things, where would I see it? At the beach? And, and how big would it be? And does it have any color? Or is it completely transparent? It is nearly transparent, and you can clearly see these crescent-shaped organs inside of them that are actually their eggs and sperm sacs, <laughs> but they can get to be about a foot in diameter. That's pretty big. And in, in this crescent-shaped sperm and egg sacs, is that where the uh, the name moon? Exactly. Comes okay. Exactly. So like it's four moon crescents that make up the sort of thing that you can see on the jellyfish. And how many limbs does it start with when it's born? I mean, what's normal? Right. When it's at its youngest stage, it has eight arms on almost all of these uh, jellyfish, but there are what we call monsters, which have more or less than eight arms. Oh, so it's not always eight. No, it's close to about 90% have eight arms, and then 10% or so span the spectrum from about four to 16 arms. When I think of jellyfish, I usually think of things with tentacles, not with limbs. Does this sort of look like a starfish? How would you describe it? That's definitely how we describe it. 
Leia, what happens to one of these guys if a sea turtle shows up, for example, and snaps off one of the limbs? They uh, don't regrow uh, what the sea turtles bite, but instead they rearrange what's left and regain radial symmetry. So how did you discover this amazing self-symmetrization? Yeah, so we got these jellyfish in and it was sort of the, the tendency that I think a lot of biologists have, which is to go back to the old school type experiments when you're working with something that you've never worked with before and try to do what others have done, but in a different organism. And for me, I was really interested in seeing how this organism would self-repair and the earliest type experiments and what we ended up doing was anesthetizing them and then removing limbs to see what would happen. And I was definitely expecting them to regenerate. Every thing in the literature talks about these ocean invertebrates like jellyfish and, and starfish for that matter being really incredible regenerators. And so we were expecting to see them regenerate. And when I cut this eight-armed starfish looking snowflake looking thing in half, instead of it regenerating that other half, I was noticing that they were looking like they were moving the arms around the center and regaining symmetry. And I first saw it and I was like, this is a fluke. This is just a weird thing that I wasn't expecting. I got to do this like 10 more times. And then um, I was set about doing that and, and quickly realized this was not a fluke and ran over to Leia and told her that there's something interesting going on here. <laughs> was this happening in real time? And you, you describe it as if you, all you had to do was cut it off and then stand there and watch. I mean, wouldn't this take a while? Pretty fast. It's definitely not in real time, but when you're doing a whole bunch of different experiments at once, if you can get data like 24 hours later, then that's pretty fast. So it was like, I cut it one day, it looks like how it used to look, and then the very next day it started looking like it was regaining symmetry. There has to be some reason that they do this, because some jellyfish do, as you've mentioned, they do regrow a limb. And I think there are lizards and things like that that can do the same. And the survival value is obvious there. I mean, it's great self-repair. But making yourself symmetric again, I mean, maybe you'd win a beauty contest right. kind of thing. But, you know, in jellyfish, I, I don't imagine that they, uh, they put photos of themselves on the web and that's the way they mate. So symmetry in general, does it have any advantage for uh, biology? Absolutely, it does. So fundamentally, Aurelia and other radially symmetrical organisms rely on their symmetry for a few different reasons. One is that they're being bombarded by their environment from many more angles than a land organism many times. So they have to be able to interact with their environment from many different directions and radial asymmetry really facilitates that. Another really important thing is the fact that these are filter feeders and if they're going to bring the water to their mouth, they basically need to have a symmetrical pulsation because otherwise you can imagine that if there isn't some water coming from the opposite side, then the water you're pushing to your mouth is just going to go right past your mouth. Exactly what does the jellyfish do to turn itself into a symmetric being again. How does that work? It's actually pretty amazing that this species really only needs to continue doing what it normally does, which is pulsing about in the water, and then that will actually lead to it regaining symmetry. So how it does that is the mechanical force generated by each of the jellyfish's flapping motions actually generates a force that pushes the arms away from each other and because they're made out of jelly, they can actually rearrange through this force. And you can imagine if everything's pushing against each other equally, then that is going to be a new balanced formation. Are they growing new cells to arrange this symmetry, or, or are they just pushing existing cells around? Right. We thought there must be new cells being made because that's the common mechanisms for self-repair in general. But Michael blocked cell proliferation in, in the jellyfish to use a specific chemical, and the, uh, the Evira is still symmetrized. So it's clear that even in the absence of cell proliferation, the Evira could still repair itself and regain symmetry. Now, jellyfish, when I think of jellyfish, of course, I think of them in terror, usually, because I, I've been stung by them. So you know, I don't look at them as, as something I'd want to study, but you have a different point of view. Uh, one intriguing property of some jellyfish, apparently, is that they can achieve some sort of biological immortality. And I have to say, that kind of interests me. Are, are there jellyfish that can live forever? Okay, yeah. so first of all, the species that we work with is actually very friendly and doesn't sting. That makes our life a lot easier. So when we're talking about immortality in jellyfish, 
really what we're talking about is a specific species is capable of aging once in the normal direction all the way to the point where it is fully mature. And then some stress can happen and in order to survive this stressful event, they can actually regress and they'll sort of do development in reverse and go back to the earlier life stage and that allows them to then age again in the forward direction. And you can imagine this cycle, if they're able to do this perfectly every single time, then theoretically they could continue this cycle indefinitely. But the immortal jellyfish was actually what we wanted to study first, and that's why we ended up bringing in this other species, because the immortal jellyfish died on its trip from Japan to California. So we got it, and it was not alive anymore, and we were upset and wanted to keep working with jellyfish in the meantime before we would get more immortal jellyfish. That's actually how we started working with the species. So I think that this uh, example of immortality or even the symmetry that we found, so now going back to your question of evolutionary advantage of regaining symmetry, you know, it's one of those things that it's uncommon, but it's the oddities or the exceptions that we find in life. This is, as my mentor used to say, they always more often than not point us to fundamentals of life. So regardless of how they evolve, we get to learn something new about how organisms survive. I have to say, Leia, the fact that these immortal jellyfish died in transit <laughs> sounds like a violation of the contract. <laughs> so, something's wrong with that. Yeah. Well, finally, this is all very fascinating from a biological point of view, <laughs> but the discovery that jellyfish can self-repair might have consequences, for example, robotics, because there we talk about self-repairing machines. Do you, do you have any insights to the people who are trying to build those? Well, I think for all of the uh, self-repairing robotics, it's a, a lot of it is a, a materials question. We're working with this biological organism that is made of this material that is both elastic and viscous. And so that makes it so that it, it has very important properties that allow it to do this self-repair mechanism. So my recommendation for, for any soft robotics people is to really look into what properties you're trying to steal from biology and replicate those as closely as possible. I'm looking forward to robots that uh, will become symmetric again. Exactly. Once they've been run over by a truck. <laughs> exactly. Leia Guntero, Michael Abrams, thank you both for speaking with us today. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Leia Guntero is a biologist at the California Institute of Technology. Michael Abrams is a biology graduate student there. Well, remarkable. I mean, the idea of resymmetrizing yourself, making yourself look lovely again. Who would have thought that that would be a strategy that had survival value? But apparently it does. I wonder if it feels anything as its remaining limbs move around. Yeah, I don't know what the nervous system of a jellyfish is. They obviously have something. But, you know, she pointed out that it's not that they're regrowing tissue. They're just moving the existing tissue around. I, you know, it's, it's so amazing what these animals can do that we can't, that it somehow gives me hope for the future, that if we can only figure out, you know, what's really going on here, that, you know, we could regrow our own limbs. I mean, there's certainly research in that area, thinking stem cells and so forth. Or you could move your legs to the center of your stomach and then you'd be able to outrun your dog on all fours. Yeah, that, that's true, but I don't think my shirts would fit. <laughs> well, the moon jellyfish certainly has remarkably quick adaptive ability, but its watery world is not as fortunate. New research on the prospects of ocean recovery from the effects of climate change next. It's The Fix Is In from Big Picture Science. The moon jellyfish begins to recover within hours of having a limb severed, and within a day or two, its body has regained radial symmetry and the jellyfish is off on its jellyfish way. But this animal's environment doesn't bounce back from affronts so quickly. A new study says that it will take longer than thought for the oceans to recover from present-day climate warming. Paleo-oceanographer Sarah Moffat and her team at the University of California at Davis are using the past as analog. With marine cores extracted from the deep sea, they studied what happened when the oceans last experienced abrupt warming. 
18,000 years ago. That was the time of the glacial maximum, the peak of the last ice age when glaciers began retreating from their greatest extent and the oceans began to warm. This is a really important event in Earth's history because it's really so recent. It's just a blink of an eye in geologic time. And so we have all these archives that we can use to understand what happened to the atmosphere, what happened to ocean systems, what happened on land. And so it's this rich laboratory to ask and answer questions about when we abruptly warm the planet, what happens? including what happens to marine animals that are sensitive to the chemistry of the deep oceans, where, for example, the amount of oxygen can change depending on temperature and ocean circulation patterns. Dr. Moffat and her team can use the cores extracted from the Santa Barbara Basin off the coast of California to determine when sea life disappeared due to changing ocean chemistry. Eventually, deep-sea biodiversity returned, but it took more than a 1,000 years. I did some work uh, looking at marine sediment records and looking at the invertebrate debris, the material in that sediment record, to understand what were the consequences when the planet abruptly warmed to seafloor ecosystems, to organisms that you could hold in your hand, like urchins and clams and snails and sea stars. What were the consequences to those organisms? If, if we were to frame your research, you looked at what happened to the ocean water as the last ice age receded. And as the oceans warmed, what happened to those waters and what happened to the creatures? And we're using that as an, at least to compare it with today's warming. That's the comparison that you're making. That's correct, because the last deglaciation, this rapid event of global warming, Within that event, you have atmospheric greenhouse gases increasing, you have global temperatures increasing, and you have sea level rising. So if you're familiar with modern climate change, you should kind of think, ding, 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 oh, all of those ring bells. Those are really similar physical earth system changes that are are happening in the modern world right now and also happened in the past. Well, let's look at let's look at the period long ago during the end of the last ice age that warming began about 18,000 years ago, which I believe is the blink of an eye in geologic terms, but it sure seems like a long time ago. The warming was abrupt. Now, how do you define abrupt because it took thousands of years, didn't it? That's right. The event is it spans about 7,000, 8,000 years. But there are, within this 8,000-year event, there are two very rapid warming events. And some of those abrupt events, or those two particularly abrupt events, take place over the course of decades, I understand. That's correct, decades to centuries. So they are, in a sense, our pseudo-analog for what we're doing right now. Now, I just want to add the caveat that the last deglaciation, this, this previous event of abrupt warming, had to do with the changing relationship between the Earth and the Sun. Um, So it was a part of the natural heartbeat of Earth's climate. It was an inherent part of the way that Earth's climate had been functioning through the Pleistocene. And so it's very different than what we're doing right now to Earth's climate. One of the things you looked at was not just the warming of the oceans, but what happened to the creatures that were living on the bottom of the ocean floor, and many of them disappeared. Do you see that in the marine cores? Do you see a bunch of fossils, and then the fossils are no more? Yeah, you do. Marine sediment records are these beautiful environmental archives of information, and they have debris from both the surface ocean and then the sea floor encapsulated in these layers that you can march back through time, just like you would march back through rings on a tree. And so there's all of this biological material. There are shells, there's pieces of shells, there are spines, there are all these pieces of organisms. And these are organisms that are are really relevant. You would recognize, if you went to the intertidal, you would recognize cousins of these organisms. So things like sea urchins and sea stars, um, lots of different kinds of clams and snails and these things called scaphopods, which are another type of mollusk. They're they're fang-like, tusk-like mollusks, really cool. They're predators. Um, So you have this incredible debris. So to get to your question about what happened during this event, what we see in the last glacial maximum, the the cold ocean of the last glacial maximum is a very diverse, abundant community that is a community that requires oxygen. And what happens during the warming events 
of the last deglaciation is that the interior of the ocean abruptly loses oxygen. And this is incredibly relevant for biological life because we respire oxygen here having this conversation and the vast majority of life in the ocean also respires oxygen. So when you lose oxygen, you are losing vast swaths of habitat for organisms that require oxygen. Can you say something about the relationship between temperature and oxygen concentration? What is the relationship in the ocean? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a basic relationship that when you warm seawater, it holds less gas. It holds less dissolved oxygen. But there's another part of this question. Like why, why, if we warm the planet, why does it impact the deep ocean? And that's because when you warm the planet, the ocean is like a layer cake. It's there, there are different layers as you move down. And as the ocean warms, those layers become stratified it becomes more and more difficult to move oxygen from the surface ocean into the interior of the ocean. The modern ocean that we have right now is an ocean that is oxygenated in the seafloor. It is an ocean where in certain key places, water is dense enough, so it's salty and cold enough to sink into the interior of the ocean. And that is how those particular places, that is how we have an oxygenated deep sea. So that's the conveyor belt that moves the oxygen from the air down to the deeper parts of the ocean where these creatures feast on it. Bingo. Yeah, that's the conveyor belt, exactly, the thermohaline circulation, which is a fundamental component of the way that both the global ocean functions and how um, the ocean sustains life in the modern world. In this show, we are examining the concept of self-repair, and the work that you've done and your team has done has looked at how the oceans were able to recover. Uh, they warmed up as the glaciers receded, and the biodiversity was lost, but then it came back. And you use this term, recover, um, and you say that it took actually quite a long time. What does it mean to say that the oceans recovered after the deglaciation period? Great question. Recovery has been a term thrown around in communities of scientists that are modern ecologists, and they, they're looking at organisms that have been disrupted by fishing or by habitat destruction. And they're, they're examining how long, if we disrupt this community, how long does it take them to recover to a state that they were at prior to the disruption? So it's a term kind of borrowed from environmental science. And the reason why we talk about recovery in response to these climate events is that when we look through these archives in the past, we see abrupt warming, like an abrupt biodiversity loss, abrupt and catastrophic change in these seafloor ecosystems. And that was a process that took decades to centuries. But the recovery back into a, a community that is dense and diverse and abundant was a process that took about a thousand years. So it sounds as though you're saying that the the warming that took place over a relatively short period of time, either decades or maybe centuries, in the oceans, then required thousands of years of recovery time. That's correct, yeah. Now, when it did recover after the glaciers receded, some of those creatures came back because today we have sea stars and urchins and clams and snails. Did the biodiversity of the oceans change much? Were these you know, evolved cousins of of the animals that had been there, or were they different species or the same species? Yeah, exactly. So these species in the past are the same as the species we would find in the modern ocean right now. They are modern species. So these are not extinction events. These are events that show us, oh, environments can change really quickly, and they can be dramatically disrupted by climate events. Now, does it matter how long over what period, of, does it matter over what period of time the oceans warm and what the source of the warming is? So 18,000 years ago, the glaciers were in retreat and the particular cycle of the earth and the sun allowed for this warming. Today, it's, it's man-made warming. It's over a different time scale. Does that matter in terms of what happens to the oxygen in the ocean or the, or the animals that rely on it? Absolutely. The kind of warming that we are doing right now to the Earth's climate, um, to our atmosphere, is so fundamentally different than anything that has been recorded in Earth's history. So we use these past events as informative analogs for understanding the capacity of 
uh, change in the future. And when I sit around with my colleagues and we talk about what kind of ocean is going to be here in 2100, you know, we have some really strong lines of evidence about what kind of ocean it's going to be. It's going to be a warm one. It's going to be an ocean with not very much oxygen. Uh, it's going to be an ocean with different kinds of circulation patterns. But we are still discovering what kinds of changes may be ahead of us. So, so Sarah, what would it take for our oceans to recover? What does that mean for you? And how much, how much time would that take? Well, I will tell you that it's people who have done modeling work, so looking using computer models and, and looking at what the ocean will look like in 100 to many thousands of years in the future, it's very clear that we are already committed to an, an ocean with very low oxygen, and to recover out of that will take a 1,000 years or more. So we are already headed to a sort of non-analog future, a future where the ocean will look different than it ever has in human history. So, Sarah, if these are essentially permanent changes to our oceans and recovery would take a thousand years or more, isn't that a kind of disincentive for people to do anything feeling that all is lost? Well, I understand that question and I understand why people would feel that way. And it really pulls on my heartstrings to, to, to consider that. And what I would love for people to remember is that the world is beautiful and it's worth every bit of our care and energy towards making it a sustainable and healthy place in the future. Understanding that these things are valuable for all of us, the nature of ocean life and ocean biodiversity, it's a global resource for all of us to share. Those things are worth preserving. Sarah Moffat, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you so much. I uh, was totally geeked out today, excited about coming and talking to you here in the studio. Sarah Moffitt is a paleo-oceanographer at the Bodega Marine Laboratory, University of California, Davis. So a rather somber assessment of our oceans. You know, there's good news and bad news because, on the one hand, at least we can find an historic analog for this warming of the ocean waters, and that'll give us some indication of what we can expect. So it's always good to know what's coming down the pike. I guess the bad news is that to begin with, what's coming down the pike is not so desirable. And secondly, this isn't like uh, the warming of the oceans after the last ice age, which took quite a bit longer than what we're doing today. Right. And if, if we were to stop warming the planet today, there would still be this long recovery time. And on one hand, it tells you something about the healing ability of the Earth. If humans just disappeared altogether, along with their cars and their smokestacks and everything else, the Earth would recover it would might not miss us all that much. Oh, I don't think it would ever have missed us. It didn't miss us for its first four and a half billion years. So the natural world has the astounding ability to recover from various assaults, although in the case of the oceans, full recovery can take a long time, even a millennium. But nature's ability to self-repair has long intrigued material scientists. After all, Evolution is the most tried and true R&D program the world has seen, also the longest. So can we borrow from the living world to create regenerative materials? Yes, but sometimes we need to borrow actual creatures. By adding bacteria to concrete, scientists have assembled a material that allows structures to repair their own cracks. We build a lot of things out of concrete. We're not the first ones to do that. The Romans were building an empire with this stuff 2,000 years ago. But the invention of self-healing concrete may make the need to repair these constructions ancient history. Limestone-producing bacteria mixed in with the concrete wait until a crack forms. That lets in water and wakes them up. Then they basically excrete concrete. And that could be useful. Material scientist Mark Miodovnik at University College London says that as solid as concrete feels when you fall off your bike and skin your knee, it is still vulnerable to wear and tear. What often happens is that water gets into the cracks and it starts to corrode the iron reinforcement inside. And that then swells because it has a different volume and causes more cracking, which then causes more water infiltration. So you actually, once you start repairing it, you can find that the thing has got a lot worse than you thought. Well, what's the typical time scale for things to go bad with concrete? Because, you know, uh, the, the Pantheon there in Rome, I think it's concrete, but it's been around for 2,000 years. Sounds like uh, you wouldn't have to repair things very quickly. 
Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, the Pantheon is a completely compressed structure, so that all the forces on it are compressing the whole concrete together. And so there are cracks in it, but the cracks are not compromising the structure because the cracks are being pressed together by the weight of the structure. So that's not the general case for things we build today. A lot of things where the cracking comes a real problem is where you have a, a bridge structure or you have something where there's tensile forces pulling it apart. And then when you have cracks, uh, of course, the, the cracks are being pulled apart and then they're extending. And then that's, as I say, creating more damage. So what about self-repairing concrete? How can that possibly work? I mean, you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to picture little concrete mixers in, the, in there that, that are spring into action whenever they detect a crack. I mean, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, it's a very intriguing technology, and it's very clever, because what it does is it takes the discovery of these things called archaic bacteria, which can withstand very high alkaline conditions in these lakes and these kind of weird places in the world. And they seem to be able to withstand it. And inside concrete is very alkaline too. And so by putting these bacteria inside concrete, they lie dormant and they're totally healthy and happy just to sit there. And they can do that for tens of years. But when a crack opens up, the bacteria wake up because of the humid air and they immediately look around for food. And the concrete manufacturers have put food into the concrete for these bacteria in the form of starch. And so the bacteria start eating the starch. And then, of course, like everyone else, they then have to excrete after they've eaten. And what do they excrete? They excrete a mineral called calcite. And that is one of the main constituents of concrete. And so they basically eat their way out of the crack, leaving behind them a pristine material. Calcite, isn't that like limestone? Yeah. That, that's the same stuff the pyramids are built of, right? Yeah. Okay, so so the, the the crack heals itself, but what happens to the bacteria now? They they die a horrible death as soon as they make, they reach the edge because they run out of food. <laughs> I see. Okay, but uh, doesn't that compromise future repair? So yeah, of course. If that crack forms in the same place, and you would have thought, given that that crack formed in the first place, that may be a weak point, then then that's a problem. And so that's why this first, let's say, prototype technology, is is really a first step. And it's still, though, an amazing step forward, I think, because it's really awakened everybody's consciousness to the idea that actually for thousands of years we've been building buildings out of materials and we've had the idea that, you know, once you put them there, that's it, they're inert. And now people are starting to think, no, let's start investigating a whole new realm of materials, self-healing materials, which we can start building infrastructure. And not just infrastructure, things like electronics and medical implants. So is it likely, I mean, I look around the city here, and, you know, all the stuff I see is built out of pretty old materials. I mean, old in the sense we've been using them a long time. The wood for houses and steel and aluminum and glass siding and stuff like that. And it's all just stuff we've essentially dug out of the ground and mainly heated up or done something to it. Uh, is this going to change by the end of this century, or is everything going to be sort of a little more dynamic? My feeling is that it will be much more dynamic and that living in a city will be a bit more like living in a forest. You know, if you go camping in the forest, it doesn't freak you out that everything around you is alive and that it's all looking after itself and that branches grow when they want to grow and they create a bit of shade or they create a bit of structure for you to sort of shelter from the rain. And my feeling is that the cities of the future will be more like that, that actually roads will look after themselves. They may even build themselves. You know, they may even detect that there's a particular desire to go in a certain direction, and off they go. You can even imagine a building kind of not only repairing itself, but kind of, you know, spawning another room when it feels like the inhabitants is, is too crowded. I mean, it sounds very far-fetched, but that's what nature does. And nature's just using physics and chemistry, and we, we're getting good at that. Well, this is truly a remarkable uh, forecast, uh, Mark. I'm, I'm waiting for my office to enlarge itself. <laughs> that would be great news. Mark Miodovnik, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Yes, nice talking to you. Mark Miodovnik is a material scientist and the director of the Institute of Making at University College London. He is the author of Stuff Matters, exploring the marvelous materials that shape our man-made world. Wow. Talk about living cities. Hope I don't have to water the parking lot. We 
We've heard a number of stories about the science of self-repair, but the question in all our minds is, could we improve our own body's ability to heal from injury or illness? Coming up, physician Heal Thyself gets a boost from molecular and computer science. Would you put billions of tiny robots inside you if they could help your body fight disease, including cancer? It's The Fix Is In. On Big Picture Science. For anyone who has ever spent time tinkering with a car or a bike or has built a ham radio or even enjoyed making things out of Legos, this science story might make you wonder why you didn't think smaller. When Sean Douglas was younger, he liked to build radio-controlled cars and planes with his dad. Now a computer scientist and assistant professor of cellular pharmacology, Dr. Douglas still builds machines, but these are a billion times smaller and not controlled with a transmitter. They're autonomous in their mission to destroy cancer cells. DNA nanotechnology is the science of assembling small devices using some of nature's tiniest building blocks. The way we think about building with DNA or building with RNA or proteins, any of these molecular building blocks that, that nature already uses, we're trying to build devices that will work in cooperation with our own immune system to perform medically useful tasks inside our bodies. Okay, well, that sounds reasonable. Devices that work with our immune system. But he's talking about biobots. Sean Douglas and his team are creating tiny, nano-sized DNA robots to coax the body into repairing itself. He's using the DNA not because of its information-carrying properties, but for its physical properties as building material. Some call the assembly of these bots DNA origami, but they don't resemble swans so much as clamshells, says Dr. Douglas, the two halves bound together by a web of DNA. When the DNA clamshell bots bind to cancer cells, the shells open, releasing their cargo of antibodies and drug molecules. Let's say you're a cancer patient. Some cells in your body are malignant, others are healthy. So how do you selectively target the diseased cells? Thinking about how do we treat these really complex diseases where some of your own cells are malfunctioning. What that's going to mean is those cells look almost identical to your healthy cells, which makes them a very difficult target. It's very hard to find cells that have subtle changes that are wreaking havoc inside your body. And so what we usually have to do traditionally to treat those diseases is we use very blunt instruments. So we'll use drugs that interfere generally with cell division, for example. And so that sounds very toxic, right? Because your, your cells are always dividing healthily for normal function. But if you take some harsh drug that interferes with cell division, yes, it will target cancer cells, which are dividing, but it'll also target other cell types like your intestinal lining or your hair follicles. All these different cells that you need to divide healthily, they are collateral damage in normal treatments. And so what we're trying to do is build devices that can tell the difference by themselves. So the device itself can look at a cell and make a decision of whether or not is this a cancer cell, is this a healthy cell, and if it is the cancer cell, then it could do something else, like deliver a drug. And if it's a healthy cell, it will just harmlessly float off to probe some other cell. And it's floating off in, in the bloodstream? or It really depends on what the application is. So if you're trying to deal with a blood cancer, we would have these devices circulating in your bloodstream. But it really depends on the application. You could imagine other applications, such as treating patients who have had a transplanted organ, whose own immune system might want to reject that organ. We could, for example, build devices which would kind of hang out near the organ and turn down the immune response locally. I think it is hard to get your mind, to get one's mind around what it is that you're proposing here, that these tiny, we, we'll call them nanobots, just... Sure. That's what, just I mean, we ease. call them that, too. Okay, but that, nanobots. that doesn't have to be scary. <laughs> it doesn't That's have like, to be scary. Yeah. Okay. But it is pretty remarkable. So you, they would go into the body 
and then they would target or seek out whatever the illness might be. How do you get them into the body? Do you swallow them? Do you inject them? Yeah, I want to be clear that these don't yet exist in a form that we're putting them in the body yet. So we're we're still in what we call the preclinical phase. But the way that would have to work in the future, you know, just like other drugs that have already gone through this process of clinical trials, is, yeah, you have to, at some point, put this into your body. Ideally, it would be a pill that you swallow. That's just much easier than dealing with injections. But it's asking more of the device if you dump it into your stomach, and then it has to kind of get out of your stomach and sort of figure out a way to get somewhere else in the body. Whereas if you just put it directly into the bloodstream, that's going to be kind of a simpler type of device. When you say it, though, it's not just a single bot. It's probably, what, thousands? Probably millions Millions. or or billions. (laughs) So one advantage that we also are excited about is the possibility of using much smaller amounts of drug. So if we are not using a blunt instrument anymore if we're using really precisely targeted devices that you really don't necessarily need more devices than there are target cells. So yeah, you could potentially reduce the total amount of material that you even have to put into the body in the first place. Well, let's talk about how these devices actually work. So, for example, cancer. If you were to put these nanobots into your body and their goal was to combat cancer cells, how would they recognize those cells and then what would they do when they found them? The way that they would work is actually they would communicate with particles that our own immune system already uses to recognize foreign invaders. So our own immune system is already really great at recognizing and actually creating new proteins called antibodies that can recognize things that your body has never seen before. Invaders. Yeah, they can be invaders. And, you know, they can also be your own cells. You know, like in the case of peanut allergies or other autoimmune diseases, you get your own cells kind of recognizing perfectly safe materials as harmful. And then, you know, that causes all sorts of problems. But the point is that the immune system is actually expert at recognizing how to bind to things. So these devices would be designed so that they would bind to the cancer cells specifically and not bind to the healthy cells. Yeah, so what you would need to do is find a unique surface marker on your target cell type. So if we're trying to target a specific cell in the body, we need to be able to design something that can tell that cell apart from every other cell. And the way to look at whether or not these cells are different is just to look at their surface or the cell membrane. And the way that we think about targeting specific cells is that cells have kind of embedded in their membranes all sorts of different proteins and sugars and this complex mesh of molecules. And some of those are going to be unique to certain cell types. Some are going to be found on every cell type or many different cell types. And what we want to do is kind of build up a unique signature or kind of a zip code of, you know, what is the target cell type that we we really want to deliver our drug to? And what is it going to look like on a molecular level to actually recognize that cell? Meaning that the outside of the cell is going to be unique each cell will be unique. The same kinds of cells will be the same, but they'll be unique enough on the outside. Things will come into relief and so forth, you know, proteins and sugars, and that this nanobot will be able to recognize which one, where it needs to land, in other words. Right, yeah. So the the nano device that we would design would be built with the capability to recognize a cancer cell and also recognize not a cancer cell. And depending on whether it's recognizing a target cell or the non-target cell, it will do different things. And if it's a cancer cell, it injects a poison? Not necessarily just inject a poison. It's more like, can we talk to the cell using its own kind of built-in messaging system that the immune system already uses to trigger cells to self-destruct? So all, all of our cells have kind of the same built-in mechanisms. Every cell by itself needs the capability both to grow and divide, but also to self-destruct if it's given that message by its neighboring cells. So one example is like during development, 
your fingers are kind of, you still have like webbing between your fingers. And at some point in development, the cells that kind of form the webbing in between your fingers are given the message that they need to self-destruct. They have to now stop dividing and, and kind of go away somehow. So you're not delivering a drug and you're not delivering a poison. You're inducing the cells to destroy themselves. So the the body itself is healing itself from within. Yeah, and it, there's another step involved, which is we're not even necessarily talking directly to the cells, but we're recruiting our own immune cells to come and deliver that message. So it's sort of, it's kind of like we give a hint to the immune system, like, hey, look here, this is a cell that you should tell to self-destruct just as if you had recognized any other disease cell or a virus or, you know, a cell that's making a virus. But isn't the body doing that with cancer cells already? It recognizes them as being cancerous or foreign or destructive to the body, and it's trying to give those cells the signal to self-destruct, but it's not working. Yeah, that's a, a great way to think about certain types of cancer is that the immune system normally has been doing its job and somehow it's failing to do that whether it's because the cancer cells have figured out some way to disable the immune response, or maybe immune cells can't recognize them anymore as targets. We think of how can we turn the immune system back on, or how can we guide the immune system to cells that are not being recognized as harmful, but are definitely harmful. Well, Sean, after these nanobots do their thing, and let's say they successfully defeat the cancer within. What happens to them? Are they flushed out of the body? Or are they floating around inside forever? Well, first we would build these devices in a way that they're safely biodegradable, let's say, that, that once they've done their job, they fall apart into harmless separate components that individually are not at all able to interfere with anything that's going on in your body. And actually, we think that's one of the advantages of building out of biomolecules like DNA, RNA, and proteins, that we're already made of this stuff, and our body already knows how to safely process it and just kind of, you know, reuse it as food, for example. <laughs> and so we just have to make sure that the nano devices that we design out of those materials are just designed in such a way that the body can easily just do its job. Well, finally, how far away are we from this technology? Is this the near future, these nanobots? Is this the far future? I definitely believe that in the span of my career, we're going to start to see diseases that are cured using this technology. And okay, fact, that could be anything because you're a young <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, so I'm 34. I want to say within the next couple of decades, I'd like to see this. But yeah, I don't think there's a really a question of whether it's going to work because we already have so many examples from nature of how these nano devices that have evolved, but they're made out of the exact same thing. They're sort of the same size, similar shapes. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just more sophisticated and kind of harder to design than what we currently can do. But like, as we get better and better at designing from these same building blocks, we should be able to achieve equal results to what we see in nature. Sean Douglas, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Sean Douglas is a computer scientist and an assistant professor of cellular and molecular pharmacology at the University of California, San Francisco. It's hard to imagine ingesting these nanobots and have them swim throughout your body or whatever they would do. On the other hand, if they could give my immune system a boost, you know, maybe I would do it. Oh, if you were sick, I'm sure you would do it. And, you know, that this idea of improving our ability to self-repair, the whole idea of self-repair, of maintenance. I mean, that's what this show is about. And it's the defining characteristic of civilization. It's about to undergo a paradigm shift for sure. Instead of extrinsic maintenance, you take something to a repair guy or you have a maintenance crew repaint your bridge, we're going to intrinsic repairs, structures, machines, even ourselves, even computer code that can find and fix its own bugs. But it has its limits. I mean, we're not able to repair the oceans. We may not be able to repair the oceans and the other ecological systems that we are changing irrevocably because of climate change. I'm more optimistic. I think that knowing the problem is the first step in solving the problem. Well, we are always optimistic about the talent that fixes this show 
Gary Niederhoff, and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to The Fix is In. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find it on our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because showtimes are fixed, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and do you have a comment, a criticism, or a suggestion? Well, throw in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Blimey, the last prize ship we took was filled with schooner repair and nanobots. I plumb forgot. Fetch us a barrel, lad. <laughs>